Thank you very much for coming on. For introducing me, I don't think they have a complete introduction. That's okay. So um, I'm not trying to remember. So I do have a mind model in college a uh, long time ago. Um, and so I trained in Ireland for almost 25 years, and then I thought I want to come back to the Middle East and more Eastern. So I'm working now at the National Guard uh, Cardiac Center, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, um, when I got the topic, holistic approach to prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and I know this is a meeting where you have a lot of internal medicine physicians, family physicians, I'm trying to keep it maybe not too hard it because that becomes really a, a bit boring for clients. So these are my disclosures. Okay, I'd like to show this slide because um, despite working in the cardiology department, I've always had the belief that Cardiology, and I am afraid it's still practice same in Pakistan is that once you have an MI, you will have an angiogram, uh, an intervention probably, and then you will be left alone. So, this is a very interesting quote from the 1800s where it was said, Physicians of the utmost pain, and as they took their fees, they said, We have no cure for this disease. So, I think unfortunately, you wait for an event to happen, like an MI, a stroke, or a crystal vascular disease, a cute ischemic event, and then nobody worries about prevention or preventing another event. Or to be honest, prevent that, making sure we don't have any cardiovascular events anyway. Despite the fact that cardiovascular disease still ranks as number one in the world, while we pay a lot of lipids uh, 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 and and of course, that's a huge turn as well, but we still have to remember that cardiovascular disease is becoming very important. Not only as a cause of fatal mortality, but also because of disease like dementia or angiogram disease, a huge cause for the healthcare system. If you look at the uh, atherosclerotic plaque, whether it happens in the coronary artery or the leg or in the brain, it has kind of usually the same mechanism. So you have a normal coronary artery or a cerebral artery, you have a fatty stream, a lot of us believe that the fatty stream starts maybe very early in life. And of course, while somebody is not following a very healthy lifestyle or we have a genetic disposition, we may end up with a lipid core, an oxidative stress, and one day, boom, you may have a bang and you may have an acute vascular event. It could be an acute stroke or a coronary event. The one thing that is very interesting is if you look at the coronary artery, most of the diseases, or most of the morbidity of coronary artery disease comes from lesions in the coronary artery that is less than 50% stenosis. So actually, these are the lesions which are not acutely inflamed, don't have a lipid core, but they're causing people a lot of symptoms. And these kind of disease, what we call endothelial dysfunction, or micro microvascular dysfunction, more common in women, actually is a more common cause or result of poor lifestyle uh, in, in people following their life. So, if you look at the cost of poor prevention, if you look at the numbers needed to treat, whether it's post MI, angina, asymptomatic subjects, or a heart failure, the numbers are quite small actually, and you can prevent one death. Unfortunately, despite that, we still have under prescribing in primary and as well as secondary prevention. And if you go back in time, looking at the beginning of the prevention era, the statin trials really set the trail at the same time to show that prevention does work, particularly, of course, in the secondary setting, but also in the primary era. So I would always like to show the slides. When we look at the cases of, say, ischemic heart disease, who should be blamed? Why we still do not have proper prevention? You have cardiac surgeons who love to do their cabbage, who have the interventionists who love to spend time in the car club, right? And if they're in the private sector, they're very lucrative. You also have the epidemiologists who love to do research, or the acute cardiologists who just see patients. So who's actually going to make a case for prevention? I think that is very important, whether you work in internal medicine, family medicine, or cardiology. So the beginning of preventive medicine really goes back into the 1950s. And we have Professor Dudley and Cannon both really coined the term prevention in the cardiovascular disease. And this was the beginning of the description of cardiovascular factors, which we are already quite familiar with. And if you look even the latest statistics in the global health study, if you look at the top causes of death, 
the top six causes are actually very common cardiovascular factors. And if you look at hypertension, that ranks the highest. I'm a hypertension uh, specialist, and from this, this is a very passionate area for me. Physical inactivity, high glucose, etc. So we can all we can print all of this. So this is the sad part to the story. And if you look at the data from the intra heart study, it showed that 90% of coronary events can be prevented if we look at the cardiovascular risk factor control. And if we take all the risk factors together, uh, it's almost 100% that we can prevent cardiovascular events. However, this is probably going to change. If you look at the model of cardiovascular prevention, we have different tiers or models or stages. So primordial uh, prevention is where your family medicine, internal medicine, the population health comes in. Where your lifestyle, whether we are eating properly, exercising, how much stress we have, all these things make an important difference. And unfortunately, I think for most of the low middle income countries, uh, we don't have a lot of infrastructure to deal with this. Of course, if we don't deal with either traditional or non-traditional risk factors, we are going to develop subclinical organ damage. For instance, people who are treating hypertension. These people will develop aqua abnormalities long before they develop heart failure. But unless we have, of course, assess them, we do not going to find out. Once they have the first event, that is too late. So primary prevention has failed, primordial prevention has failed. Now you have somebody with an MI or a stroke or a acute ischemic event in the leg. So now you have to deal with secondary prevention. All these prevention modules or stages are equally important to save lives. So if you look at the Urbicide cardiology recommendations, because I don't want to spend too much time, I think most of us read about it all the time. Smoking is an absolute, absolutely no. So non-smoking is, uh, is crucial to prevent any form of cardiovascular disease. We cannot deal with percentages. I think Pakistan still ranks quite high. Almost 36% of people smoke, with even higher in males. So I think this is an area where a lot of work needs to be done. Physical activity, we all need, all know, about 50 minutes a week, 30 minutes of uh, very brisk walking every day, etc. And of course, we can spend a lot of detail on that. Body weight should be kept at the ideal level. Blood pressure less than 140 over 90. Of course, if you look at the new American guidelines, they advocate 130 over 80. And of course, the lower the better if the patient tolerates it. Uh, LDL goals, of course, depend on primary prevention, so less than 2.6 millivolts per liter. If it's secondary prevention, less than 1.8. And of course, we have many other cholesterol components. So these are the standard guidelines that we get from your center cardiology or indeed the ACC or any other uh, guideline body. However, more and more uh, as emphasis is placed on total risk assessment, what we call the absolute risk. So why we talk about individual risk factors, what happens when you put them together? Because we want to know what is the likelihood of somebody having an event in 10 years. So score system is one of the systems used in Europe. And the advantage of the system is it does not only calculate ischemic heart disease risk, but also uh, full cardiovascular disease risk, whether it's stroke or uh, any peripheral vascular disease event. So whether you're in a very, very high disease risk area in Europe, or in Eastern Europe, or low, uh, uh, low disease risk, you can take age of the patient, the gender, the blood pressure, and the cholesterol, and you can put, put them together and this will give you a level of risk for ranging from 1 to over 15%. So higher the risk, the more likely that the person is going to have a fatal cardiovascular event in the next 10 years. And you can see if you're a low, low risk area, you will have a lot of green boxes and less red boxes. And once we classify these people as very high risk, high risk, moderate risk or low risk, depending upon the score, for instance, if the score is more than 10%, or the person already has a history of cardiovascular event, these people are very high risk and you're going to have very aggressive prevention strategies. And whether they're high risk, between 5 and 10%, uh, if you have somebody with, uh, between 1 and 5%, it's low to moderate risk. So depending upon that, clinicians sitting or cardiologists sitting in an office can decide how aggressive they want to be. And of course, this chart will take into account, depending upon your score risk, whether you're going to be only for lifestyle modification or you're also going to do new treatment therapy. You can see as your score goes higher and as you move rightward towards your cholesterol levels, 
You're going to get more and more red. That means you're going to get lifestyle, aggressive medical treatment, and etc. However, there is one problem with absolute risk. The absolute risk, for instance, if it's low, say it's 1% or 2%, as you can see here. Uh, yeah. So, you will say, well, maybe I don't need to treat this person aggressively, compared to this individual who has a vascular disease history and the risk is 3.4%. But actually, if you look at the relative risk, relative risk is compared to another person, uh, the reduction in risk after getting the treatment the benefit is the same in both individuals. And this is the catch when we compare absolute versus relative risk. So a lot of people are moving away from this absolute risk strategy as well because we are ignoring a lot of people who may have a lower absolute risk in the population but maybe other factors like a strong family history or a high inflammatory marker, they may actually have more benefit after uh, intervention. So, the population versus the high uh, risk approach is where we need to think about it. So the traditional view is, we take somebody with very high blood pressure or very high cholesterol, we will very aggressively manage them. And I need somebody with blood pressure 130 or 90 or 140 or 80, you're going to be less aggressive. So the tails of the curve for both cholesterol and blood pressure pose a problem. Actually, what has been seen is, the greater benefit is in between. If you treat people, the high volume of people who have the moderate, low to moderate risk, your benefit at the end of the day in preventing cardiovascular events is actually higher. So, I always uh, quote Margaret Thatcher, when somebody she was asked about the Armstrong and inquiry, that you know, there are rules to follow. She said, guidelines are only for fools. You know, you need to use your brain. So, we have the guidelines, they give you the absolute risk, but when you're sitting in the clinic with a patient, you look at all the metrics and the risk is low, but then you find out their parent uh, or somebody died at 35 years of age, or you find that his CRP is high, or any other tradi non-traditional risk factor, really need you to think about relative risk. So this person may be at quite high risk as uh, compared to what you think. The other thing I really wanted to focus more rather than spend time on giving you guidelines and guidelines, everybody can go on the web and read the guidelines is that things start moving faster than us. So while we were implementing primary secondary prevention strategies, the fast food chains and a lot of the media were bombarding you with all the nice foods full of fat and sugar. So despite all the intervention we are doing, there is another problem. And this problem can be seen, this is a paper published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, that we've done very well in terms of smoking, reducing blood pressure, total cholesterol, and improving physical activity. And that has given us really good reduction and saved lives over the years. And this is between 1980 to year 2000 in the US. But look at the red areas. This is where the prevalence of obesity and diabetes has really gone very high. And that has led to a negative impact. So what benefit you are getting here is you're losing uh, in terms of people who are getting more obese. And this is data from some of my own work going back years that I did in Ireland, where we went into some projected modeling uh, in terms of beneficial benefits obtained after primary prevention. We found that actually the risk factors were really much better. Smoking went down, cholesterol went down, blood pressure went down, treatments were very good, people were using secondary prevention. However, at the same time, there was an increase in diabetes, obesity, and physical activity was not less. So whatever dividends you were getting out of doing all the interventions, you were really fighting an uphill battle because you were nullifying all the positive effects you were doing. So this is something that we all need to face in, uh, in most of these countries. So the new concept in prevention is not really the standard cholesterol blood pressure. It is what we call the ideal cardiovascular health. And this is proposed by the uh, in, the, in the United States, where we call the life simple cell. So you have three uh, risk factors, cholesterol, blood pressure, smoking, so this should all be optimal. And you have the health behavior, so um, that obesity, having a healthy diet, having uh, no physical inactivity, etc. These and proper, proper diet is as important. So these metrics 
have become quite standard now in many of the, in the, in the Western world. <laughs> and when we looked at the data in the population, what was really striking was that while they could control of smoking, fasting glucose, blood pressure, okay, it was suboptimal, but maybe it wasn't as bad. The worst metrics were healthy diet score was very poor, people were physically inactive, and they had a high body mass index. So we're coming to the same point that while people may be taking statins and metformin, we have another problem evolving. And if you look at data, and this is, this is a very large um, group of data looking at all cause mortality, it tells you the less your healthy matrix, the more likely you have, you're going to die. So whether we looked at all cause mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, or ischemic disease mortality, the best matrix give you a very high chance of survival. So out of the seven, the more you have, the better you can fail. And of course, why is obesity so bad? I mean, we talk about, okay, you know, you, you develop fat, etc. But the main issue is your visceral fat. And unfortunately, South Asians, we have a genetic predisposition to get tummies. So we get fat around the waistline. And why is this fat bad? This fat is actually very different from the fat in the shoulders or the hips. This has a big source of inflammatory cytokines. It is secreting CRP, uh, GNF-alpha, adiponectin, IOS, P1, mention any, any of the inflammatory cytokines, which are going to go to your blood vessels and cause all sorts of vascular resistance. So, looking at what we call the metabolic syndrome, and I'm sure there was a, there was a talk yesterday, we all know about it, uh, as the number of risk factors of, of metabolic syndrome increases, so does the uh, metabolic mortality due to cardiovascular disease go up. This is some of the work that I did myself and we looked at the patients with metabolic syndrome and hypertension and we found that those who have greater number of risk factors of metabolic syndrome, the more stiff their arteries are, whether we look at the aorta or we look at these small arteries uh, like the brachial. So obviously the metabolic syndrome has an independent effect on the vessel wall and you can also appreciate it actually at the level of the heart. So once your metabolic syndrome, once you develop more than one risk factor, you have echo abnormalities. For instance, you have poor mid-wall fraction shortening, you have more concentric remodeling in the heart, which is early damage to the heart uh, because of high blood pressure. And what I find interesting is, and there's a lot of work done, especially in the South Asian countries, why there is a high amount of coronary disease, why do individuals in these regions have small coronary arteries and that's why they get more coronary events as compared to those in the Caucasian country? And why are we getting a more obesity and visceral obesity as time goes on? And maybe the Barker's hypothesis, which states that malnutrition uh, while the baby, before the baby is born in the, with the mother actually leads to a small sized baby and they do not develop their cardiovascular system as well. And after they are born, actually they are more likely to develop obesity in their life and they also have a very poorly developed coronary circulation. So the Barker hypothesis may explain some of the factors of metabolic syndrome and increased coronary disease mortality in these countries. And again, the thrifty gene. This is again something I like to talk about, especially in this part of the world, that while most of the genetic markers in the cardiovascular system, and this is the work we did so many years back, they program you or they protect you from adverse events. Somewhere down the evolutionary line, when you were hunting millions of years ago, the body wanted to keep food to yourself. So because you wanted to survive, the natural tendency of the body is to keep calories. And this gene called the GG276 polymorphism, unfortunately is very rampant. Uh, it is more common in populations and also in the South Asian populations. So thrifty puts you at risk of becoming obese. And this may also be something that has to be kept in mind when we're looking at obesity. And of course, adiponectin is something we looked at. It's reduced in people who are obese. Adiponectin is a very nice uh, cytokine. It works against uh, C-reactive protein, so it protects the body. And actually, the higher the level you have, the more nice your vascular function is. And Coming to HSCRP, I think this is one of the very important factors that you must have read about in a lot now, that as the metabolic syndrome components increase, CRP increases, and it's becoming one of the important markers, for instance, the Reynolds score, 
which is very good in women, includes the HSCRP. So once you're over three, you're at high risk of cardiovascular disease. As you can see here, so people who have a high CRP, more than three, have the poorest survival. So HSCRP is actually very useful if you're looking at somebody with indeterminate risk. If you put HSCRP in this situation, you may be able to make a very good decision how to manage them. Uh, this is where we looked at, uh, again, what we call, uh, took a smoking model, and we wanted to see smokers, for instance, get a lot of cardiovascular disease. What is the mechanism? Well, one of the mechanisms, of course, is they have very high levels of CRP, into you can 6, TNF alpha, but also they have very stiff arteries. But what was interesting was we followed them for 10 years. And after 10 years, there was a reduction in the stiffening of the arteries once they have stopped smoking. So while the, most of the guidelines to suggest that once you stop smoking, it takes about one year, actually for the vessels to come back to the normal size, it takes almost 10 years. And this, of course, tells you why. Uh, this is something we wanted to explore further once we found out why are ex-smokers still going around the stiff vessels. Is because compared to never smokers, ex-smokers still have raised inflammatory markers, especially uh, interleukin 1 and also vascular endothelial growth factor. So these uh, inflammatory cytokines are going to put you at risk of cardiovascular disease. So the message is don't smoke at all because even if you give a smoking, it's going to take a long time to come back to pre smoking levels. And of course, if you look at stiff arteries, there's a very strong relationship with vascular inflammation, and that ties in the story quite well, that maybe the vascular inflammation is really driving the pathology in not only the coronary artery, but also in the peripheral vasculature. And I think we're all familiar with the Cantos trial recently, where the biologics, the immigrant graph, was used to prevent coronary artery disease, and there's a very successful trial. So I think the uh, future will be trying to prevent vascular inflammation, in terms of the prevention model. Oxidative stress is another one where we have to focus. So all the bad food and all the bad diets we take, especially the high fatty food, puts your vessels at risk because it causes a lot of oxidative stress. And here we looked at uh, hypertensive individuals who had oxidative stress and you can see they have much higher left ventricular mass index if they have high oxidative stress as well as very stiff arteries. So coming back to us, so what do we do? Uh, well, nutrition is the key. So, well, you walk around and everything, but the simple answer is keep your mouth closed. Don't eat too much. So most of the data tells us that. We have so many diets going around and people try all sorts of them, but most of the data suggests that after six months, people all tend to pleasure because the key is to keep your diet pretty low because our ancestors do not eat a lot and we have a tendency to retain calories. So if you look at the diet evidence for primary prevention, I think you're all familiar with the Mediterranean diet. So the Mediterranean diet recently has been shown for both primary and secondary prevention to reduce cardiovascular events. And I would like to move quickly forward. Uh, this is the DASH diet, and I think you're all familiar, especially those who deal with blood pressure a lot. Uh, this is a diet high in fruits and vegetables and low in sodium, which we have to take for patients with hypertension. Uh, the more you have uh, a good DASH diet, the lower your blood pressure will be. So secondary prevention, the line diet for study. So if you already have a cardiovascular event, again, if you have a Mediterranean diet, you're going to have much better survival than power. And again, omega fatty acids, very positive results, uh, more for primary and secondary prevention. So this is what I want to show. If you go back to the hunter-gatherer time, and these are the aborigines, you can see how fit they were. You know, from the cardiovascular, metabolic point of view, those were ideal individuals, right? And what did they have? This is called the hunter-gatherer diet. They had no dairy products. They did not have any carbohydrates because at the time there was no farming. So they had to hunt to eat. And when once they had eaten, maybe not eaten for days. And they walked a lot. So if you look at the guidelines from the European Center of Cardiology, it gives you a lot of details down to grams. It tells you actually they're recommending exactly the hunter-gatherer diet. So the Mediterranean diet or the hunter-gatherer diet is really the way to go. It's low, low carbohydrate, very low fat, and high fruits, vegetables, and legumes. So, I don't want to offend anybody, but I think this is what it is. The more we eat, the more we put our weight. There is no secret to it. 
And of course, the physical activity is the final thing that you have to think about. You know, there's a very strong correlation between having coniac in these events and exercise volume. The more, more you exercise, the less chances you have of having any event. And there is a relationship with the intensity. So just walking, very light walking is actually not beneficial. Uh, and running. So this is quite uh, useful. And this study, which is the nurse health study, shows very clearly that people who walked a lot or exercised a lot, and here we measure it as met hour per week, they benefited the most. So if you have five minutes a week, you have least chance of getting coronary disease and also the relative risk. So the more you walk, the more you exercise, the more benefit you achieve. And of course, if you look at the pedometer trials, there will be a lot of uh, trials where they've given people a pedometer or an accelerometer, and they found a very big benefit in terms of achieving prevent cardiovascular prevention because it seems to reinforce exercise in individuals. So once they start monitoring, for instance, a lot of our apps and mobile phones have uh, step counts, you will have positive reinforcement or positive feedback and you're going to exercise more. And actually, some of the work I did uh, in Ireland where we looked at physical activity using accelerometers. So accelerometers are objective measures. So you tie the accelerometer to the person. And these are very, very accurate using a satellite system. And we found that uh, most individuals who exercise very little had actually very high stiffness in the vessel walls. And you can see those who are inactive had very high levels compared to those who are vigorously active. So the more vigorously active you are, the more elastic your arteries are. And these were very middle-aged individuals. So it's actually very interesting to see uh, at heart and early stage, poor physical activity can impact health. And of course, if you think about our life these days, it is very stressful. And more and more people are becoming aware now in, cardi in cardiology that depression, stress, actually has a very strong way to play in terms of obesity as well as in cardiovascular events. And if you look at most of the data, depression, you can see, look at this graph here. The clinical depression after adjusting for all other comorbidities is actually strongly related with cardiovascular events. And if you look at the BDI score, which uh, delays depression, you can see if you have a very high BDI score, your survival is very poor. So people who are depressed actually, regardless of how well you control the cardiovascular risk factors, are not going to have a good outcome. And that is the reason a lot of the people, mostly in, in, in cardiology, we would have psychologists to deal with these issues. Uh, if you look at the PSI, which is the anxiety index, the same issue, you can see very high uh, relative risk values for developing coronary disease. So your acute myocardial infarction risk goes high in people who are very anxious. The data in terms of intervention is, however, a little bit disputed. There are some studies say that if you do psychosexual uh, intervention, it does work, people do improve, and they have less chance of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, some studies are also negative. And I think the reason is that depression and anxiety are tied very closely to other metabolic parameters. So the mind and the body work together, and we need to remember that. And finally, I'm coming to the end of the talk. We should not forget the patients. We are always talking about them as somebody, but actually they will also determine how successful we are. So if you look at the prescribing, once you've given somebody a statin or any other medication like an inhibitor, after six months, half of them are not taking the medication. So persistence of medication is very poor. So this is the reason, this is some work we did a long time ago uh, looking at the polypill. And you can see combining drugs into one single tablet will have a great benefit uh, in terms of reducing uh, persistence rates. And again, also your benefit in terms of efficacy will be very high. You're all well aware of the polygon studies going around the world, and I think hopefully we will have that for prevention as well. If you look at the population in large, most of the people start taking a lot of the, what we call lifestyle medicine. Most of them are antidepressants, they're taking PPIs, all are self-inflicted. So these people, are not going to comply with your medication, whether using primary or secondary prevention. So it is very important to develop very good communication skills and also need to be aware of what we call alternative therapy. So in cardiology, we are becoming aware of what we call complementary and alternative treatments. Because a lot of patients are turning now to those treatments because they think the regular treatment doesn't work. So if you look at 
80% of patients say the study showed in a cardiology clinic they were using CAM. And they would not discuss with the cardiologist, but most of them were using multivitamins, fish oils, vitamin E, folic acid, coenzymes, garlic, etc. And they never tell the cardiologist. And the danger is that there will be some un, 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 uh, foreseen drug interactions with these medicines. So finally, I'm coming to the end. Uh, Professor Jolly from very kindly asked me, as I'm running the cardiovascular disease prevention program in Saudi Arabia, how do you work that up? So this is what we call a CBD prevention program. Of course, it requires uh, physicians, which include general medicine physicians as well as cardiologists. But we also have nurse specialists and exercise physiologists, a dietitian, a pharmacist, a psychologist, we have administration, and also we have a very closely aligned department of cardioinformatics. And of course, all the investigations are there to actually run this very, very heavy program. And this gives you an example. The program was started in 2000 and coming to 2013, you can see the number of patients. We always have 10,000 patients going to the program every year. This is a largely secondary prevention program, but we also have some primary prevention in the form of lifestyle modification and a hypertension program. And you can see this whole program is uh, working on an electronic database. So everything that you enter, if the patient did not take some medicine, we have all the tick boxes that you can tick what was the reason for not taking the medicine, and all this data is actually extractable. And this paper shows you one example of how you can use this data to do an audit and inform your clinical practice. So coming to the end, I think the problem is, it's very easy to say we want to do prevention, but really, can we do something else? That's what everybody asks. So I will end my talk uh, just with this slide. Mm -hmm. I think if you put people, especially from the cardiology era, prevention is really uh, very much uh, ignored. And this is something we really need have to think about, whether we are working in cardiology, dental medicine, or family medicine. So thank you very much, all the chairs and everybody else for your attention.